Hello everyone, my name is Clancers and welcome to the Clancers without further ado. Let's get into this video, but before we get into the video, because it's a long time I haven't said this, smash the like button. As you guys can see, that we are stuck on 13,000 subscribers simply because for over a month we have not been live or been posting videos as a result nobody was smashing like button nobody was watching videos for reasons i don't understand so now that we are back please do me that favor so we can continue to grow where we left off by smashing the like button for me thank you so much to everybody that is new on this channel welcome to the clan you are officially the member of the clan. Thank you so much for choosing us. So without further ado, let's go to the knockout thing high court that we've been anticipating since when was it when no, the court? Okay, whenever it was in December. Now let's get into the resumption of the Senzo Mewa murder trial. As you guys already know that when the court closed for the year, we were trial within a trial and Brigadier Geninda was on the stand being cross-examined by the defense after he has given his evidence in chief, which today I thought, hmm, drama, drama, drama. Well, before I get into what happened today, let's start with the drama that took place between Judge Rata and Advocate Ngome Zulu to a point where Advocate Ngome Zulu put the judge in his place by making his intentions of lodging section 317 against Judge Rada. And I was like, what is section 317? I took the liberty of finding out what is section 317 says. So of course, I went to the Criminal Procedure Act 51 of 1977 to look it up. And this is what I found, if I may read it for you. It says that section 317 Subsection 1 provides for the noting of a special entry on the record alleging irregularities during the preceding trial. Now, Evergitim Gomez Zulu basically accused the judge of being biased. He basically said there is a difference of how you treat the state versus how you treat the defense. Actually, he said how you treat the defense when there is a witness on the stand. Basically, he was accusing him that he is basically taking the side of the witnesses instead of presiding neutrally. Of course, the writer, like the writer we know, he tried to defend himself, but Advocate Ngome Zulu stood on his ground and said, I'm lodging that application against you. I was like, you got Ngome Zulu, because this was a long time coming. I would have thought that Rata would have taken this month that he was not presiding over this matter and really look at what exactly people are saying. Why are people think that I'm being biased? Why do people think I am for the state and also humiliating the defense with the witnesses? But he did not do that self-reflection uh, or assessment to come back today and basically preside like a judge should preside over a matter. And he's like, no, 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 I'm just using the law. Yes. Use the law when it's appropriate for a judge to use the law, not when the judge becomes a witness, not when the judge becomes a prosecutor, not when a judge becomes everything to uh, that is not supposed to be as a presiding officer. And that's exactly what Advocate Gomez Zulu was trying to tell him that, listen, can you be neutral? That's it. And of course, the Judge Rata was taken in his place and he behaved like a judge for a few moments because I did see he tried to get this uh, rata that we know uh, rear out, but then now and again he will catch himself and say, I am not interfering. I'm just trying to get clarity about this certain uh, piece of law. I did not have a problem with him asking about that or even making clarity with what Ngome Zulu had said about uh, in, in um, what do you call this non-official statement when the constitution is clear on when the police take a statement, the the suspect's rights must be uh, read according to section 35 of the constitution. I agree with the judge there and that is what you expect a judge to do, not to come in and interject and, and say things that he's not supposed to be saying and leaving everybody thinking, is this supposed to do that? Is this supposed to do that? But... I'm glad that Advocate Gomez Zula has made his intentions and hopefully an investigation is going to ensue out of this and probably Judge Rata will be put in his place by the regulation body that regulates judges or maybe he'll be recused from this matter altogether if he has some kind of interest. 
And then while I was busy reading this particular section 317, I found a very recent authority. Uh, let me just read it for you. It is uh, State versus Tabata and others, August 2022 in 2022 and i think this is a south african uh high court journal of some sort page 163 of the 14th of december 2022 this is if you're interested to find out what were the outcomes of the lodge of 317 against a particular judge that presided over the state versus tabeta and others I find it very interesting that Judge Rata decided to interpret Mgome Zulu's lodge as being interfering when he in fact accused the judge of favoritism. Anyway, let's get back to what happened in court today. Of course, Brigadier Geneda took the stand and he was reminded of the oath that he was going to tell nothing but the truth. And boy, <laughs> well, how things were tweaked in this last month is very interesting i personally find or think that plan b was put on the table because they realized that nah even with the trial within a trial we are losing meaning baloy realized that i'm losing this one as well because he already lost the main trial and he wants to salvage this one so that he can revive the main trial and that is why dinita comes to court and he's telling tales that left me going but i did not hear that in your evidence in chief what are you talking about? Please tell us more. So the first thing that almost got me falling off my chair was the fact that he said uh, the death of Senzo Mayor was not a robbery when wrong. In fact, it is a hit, an assassination. A hitman was hired to kill Senzo Mayor. And in my mind, I'm like, wait a minute, but you did not mention this in your evidence in chief. What are you talking about? So for the first time, the court hears this matter of an assassination of, uh, of Senzo Meiwa. Um, I think I even saw the judge squinting a little bit, with like, like taken aback. But I was taken aback completely because I was like, this is a bombshell that you just dropped uh, Geninda. What's happening? Like I said, for me, it felt like plan B because the one that Advocate Baloyi was going with because he told those courts in the beginning of the trial that he's going to prove beyond reasonable doubt that uh, the death of Senzo Mayor was a robbery went wrong. Now, why are we hearing totally different information now about Senzo Mayua being assassinated. But all of this started with Advocate Ngome Zulu trying to find out from Geninda the procedure to obtain a J50 from the magistrate's court in order for that uh, J50 to be issued by the court and then he goes and makes an arrest of accused number one and accused number two. And why the address of accused number one was not on the J50 when in fact he was in jail. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, Geninda went on his law lecture to a point that Advocate Ngome Zulu was quite irritated with him and reminded him this that this is not a criminal law 101 lecture. Please answer the question. But Geninda was going about the bushes, not wanting to answer this particular question. But eventually, when Advocate Ngome Zulu became sarcastic and uh, Geninda took offense to that and made what you would think a heartfelt uh, statement about how he is here to help the court and how the, he expects to be respected by the court officers uh, like Advocate Ngome Zulu and of course Advocate Ngome Zulu I felt he was pushed against the wall by this particular statement and said if I have offended you in any way with how I am asking you these questions I apologize and I was like Advocate Ngome Zulu you should not have apologized because you were on the money here this man does not answer questions Question. He's evasive and he goes on in a lecture and every time he agreed with Advocate Ngome Zulu, it was always followed up with a but. And then you know that there is going to be criminal law 101 uh, lecture that is going to come from Geninda. I'm not quite sure if he's proving a point that even though I am doing LLB through Uni UNISA, it doesn't mean that UNISA is bad. And I agree, UNISA is not bad when it comes to its LLB. As a matter of fact, I think UNISA LLB courses are one of the best. 
I don't know why people think it is something to be discarded and it's a uh, lack of quality because at the end of the day, UNISA is teaching the same law that Wits University Law School is teaching, that Stellenbosch University um, Law School is also teaching, as well as UTS, as UTS as UCT School of Law is also teaching. When all these people are in court, they are talking about the same law because our law is uniform. There's nothing like, oh, you went to UNISA, I went to Vince University, or I went to Stellenbosch. They are all South African law, nothing else. So I think maybe he tries to prove a point to anybody that is listening that, listen, I may be going through UNISA studying LLB, but listen to me. I'm eloquent and I know the law. The other bombshell that I thought uh, that Gininda dropped in his affidavit that he ended up reading in court was the fact that he says that in Danzi at one point, he was willing to become a state witness and read out against accused number one, three, four, and five regarding the plans of killing Senzo Meiwa until he changed his mind. If you ask me, the state at this point is definitely shooting in the dark. I think Advocate Baloy realizes that he is losing the trial within a trial. He realizes that now there are two versions of this particular process. One moment it was a robbery went wrong and also Muhane um, Muhanu as well as all the other witnesses that they have come to testify on a robbery went wrong. Why now the head investigator comes and tells a totally different story about who killed Senzo Meiwa and I think maybe he's trying to get the court to admit this statement so that it is revealed who is the mastermind behind the hit. Who is the person that sold Senzo Meiwa to be killed by the so-called accused that are in court today? And I think, I think Judge Rata, in as much as we do not uh, feel him and we are suspicious of him, I think he is forced at the end of the day to rule according to the constitution in this matter because there are too many constitutional discrepancies that, that took place with Gininda as well as all the witnesses that have taken the stand thus far, including the accused number one and accused number two, being read out their rights in English and by a person who could not speak Zulu, even if it slapped him in the face. So as Gininda was going on about this elaborate plan to kill Senzo Meiwa, this is when Judge Rata rightfully so told Gininda that he is going to declare everything that he has said, nothing but hearsay. I was like, that's good. Even though this particular affidavit, it's still to be determined whether everything that was said, including the statement of Ndanzi, remember the whole point of a trial within a trial is to see whether the statement that was made by Ndanzi, as well as accused number one, is to be admitted into evidence for the main trial, meaning that uh, was the confession legit? Was the confession done according to the book? And then if he says, yes, it was, then it is admitted into the main trial. And this is exactly what Baloy wants so that he can save his main trial because he lost it. He lost it with the DNA. He lost it with so many things that uh, that were, uh, what do you call it, were, were said in the main trial. The third or fourth the bombshell in Gininda's statement was about the eyewitnesses saying that it was a revolver. Now, why do we have, um, what was the lady's name again that I always confuse her surname? Yes, that one. She found a bullet head of a 9mm, not revolver. But Gininda's statement of the affidavit, it talks about a revolver. So, here we go once again. This trial, where is it going to? So it was quite funny when you hear uh, Gininda says that there is uh, no particular requirement for the physical address of a suspect to be on the J50 when they go to make a, um, a, an application with the magistrate. But the advocate Tim Gomez Zulu was like, as an experienced person in the police force, you know that a physical address is needed on the J50. But Gininda was adamant that no, that is not a requirement. And this is when Advocate Mgomezulu said, well, he will leave this one for arguments.
And the second argument was around the jurisdiction of the Fosnerazer and Boxberg court where uh, accused number one was taken to, basically was taken to Boxburg instead of Fosleras. And Ginita said, well, both the courts, they share the same jurisdiction. Whether you take the suspect to Fosleras or you take the suspect to Boxburg, as long as the crime was committed in Ekuruleni, therefore both these magistrates' court share the jurisdiction. And of course, Advocate Gomez Zulu said, well, I'm going to leave this one for argument because he... Geninda knows for a fact that is not true. And I don't think it's true either. I really don't think so. I think Geninda was using the high court level between the North Houghton High Court and the South Houghton High Court that it doesn't matter where the suspect is taken to or the accused at this point, whether they are taken to the South Houghton High Court or the North Houghton High Court. I don't think it applies the same at the magisterial level. I think a crime that is committed in Fosleras and Katlahong and places like that, the jurisdiction is the Fosleras uh, Magistrates Court. Uh, any crime that is committed in, bon in Benoni, Campton Park, no, Campton Park has its own Magistrates Court. Uh, maybe let's say Benoni, uh, I don't know what, what all these other places are in the East. I think that one will go to the Boxburg Magistrates Court. Not that they share the same jurisdiction. But it's going to be interesting to hear Advocate Mgomez Zulu's argument about that particular jurisdiction. Because uh, Gininda said both these courts, the Bosberg and the Fosleras Magistrates Courts, are managed by the same person. I was like, but still, really? I, I don't know. We'll see. I'm not a, uh, an expert around this. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a judge. I'm not anybody that is in the legal world, but I'm rubbing my two IQs together and I'm like, mm -mm, something isn't right about Gininda's misleading of the court. So as Gininda was proceeding with his affidavit as well as his testimony, I think he accidentally made mention of the Kwanongoma uh, murder case, which was, by the way, resolved. Even Mukhane said it was resolved and a conviction was secured in a Mr. Butelezi but Gininda spoke about a different docket that they are busy investigating uh, accused number two, which is Bongani Tanzi. And this is when Advocate Mshololo stood up in objection and said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, the Gininda, oh, well, the, the witness is busy talking about a document that the defense has no position of. And therefore, he, she, requests, she requests that the court makes an order to Gininda to submit this particular docket to the court or to the uh, to the defense so they are able to peruse and then come back and be able to defend their clients uh, fairly. And of course, earlier on, and I must also speak for Judge Rata, he did make an order earlier to the witness and said, every document that you have not submitted in respect of the accused in court, submit them so that this trial is a fair trial to the accused. In my mind, I'm like, yes, Jack, this is how you're supposed to behave like. Why must you be put in your place and be uh, threatened with Section 317 in order for you to do your job properly? And this is when Judge basically reminded Advocate Mishololo that, listen, I did make an order earlier about documents that are outstanding that uh, the defense has been asking for, but all the witnesses will say, oh, they are with Gininda. And he made an order that those documents be uh, disclosed so that the, the, the accused, they have a fair trial. So this is when the judge turned to the defense and asked if they would like an adjournment so that uh, Geninda can make copies of this particular document and then hand it over to them so that they can peruse and also consult with their clients. No, no, not consult with their clients because he made a ruling that uh, this particular document is private and confidential. He even said this must not happen like with the previous confidential uh, document, which is now public or now no longer private. Uh, and then he made a very stern warning that this must only be for the eyes of the defense and the prosecutor together with the court, but this document must not be taken home. Of course, the defense was like, okay, cool, no problem. As long as we have uh, this particular document and we are able to look at it so that we know what Gininda, uh, what the witness is talking about. In my mind, I was like, okay, 
let's use this as a case of once bitten, twice shy. I, I, listen, listen, defense. If you ever watch my channel, this is my tip for you before you go to bed. In the morning, when the accused are brought to court and they are placed in the dungeon, before the court starts, ask to go down to your clients. You are not going there to consult. You are not going to consult. You are not going there to consult. At least Advocate um, Nisi as well as Ramasupili should go downstairs to the clients and basically search their pockets in case the prison guards slipped in copies or pieces of uh, copies of this particular document that is private so that uh, Gininda does not say, oh, I heard news that uh, the defense had given the, the accused pieces of the document. And then again, we have a situation where the judge accuses the defense of being rotten. Or if it's not that scenario, they must be aware that anything can happen. Remember, right now, Advocate Baloi is limping. Me, I'm not going to say he's limping. I say this case is dead and buried, but he's trying to res uh, to exhume it and bring it back to life, but it just keeps dying on Advocate Baloy. So do not take any chances with this one. Do not even give your clients any piece of paper whatsoever. They must not even hold a piece of paper whatsoever. That will make Gininda say, uh, I see the, 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 the accused, they're holding a piece of paper, uh, violating or breaching the order of the court once beaten twice shy we are expecting a publicity stunt from the uh, from the uh, from the state regarding the confidentiality of this particular document watch out because it is clear that uh, the state wants to discredit the defense the credibility of the defense must be destroyed so that this judge can take a ruling in favor of the state in respect of this particular confession that is in with the trial within a trial of accused number one and accused number two. So tomorrow is going to be quite interesting to see what exactly was in this particular docket that uh, Gininda as well as Mukhanu were busy working on regarding accused number two, Bongani Tanzi, in respect of the Nongoma murder or whatever investigations that they were conducting against Ntanzi. My interest is to find out if Ntanzi was arrested or charged or he was brought to court. What happened once this docket was put together? Or it was just sitting there waiting for this particular trial to be over is acquitted and then they charge him with a with fresh uh, charges what's going on i understand that uh, um brigadier gininda as well as uh Mohane, they did win the case of planted evidence i believe where accused number one was sentenced to 10 years in prison for possession of illegal firearm and whatever else that they accused him of i think he is going to be exonerated by this very trial because that in particular evidence would have been acquired illegally and of course the magistrates i think they took the decision to say listen we'll take this decision but it's going to be overturned by the high court if the high court does find uh, accused number one not guilty of the murder of Senzo Meiwa in the end. So, well, guys, until we hear what's happening tomorrow, I will leave this right here. My thoughts are, well, they are using Plan B. And Plan B is the story of a hitman that killed Senzo Meiwa. Who is the mastermind? That's the question. And I think the answer it is embedded in the confession that Ndanzi was forced to sign. Because he says, I did not write any statement. I was told to put my signature and my thumbnail on top of this particular document. Who is Gininda eyeing for or gunning for as the person to take the fall for the death of Senzo Meiwa? A part of the accused that are in the dock today. So until then, guys, thank you all so much for watching. Please do not leave this video without liking. And also, why would you be watching my video and not subscribe? And click the bell notification so that you get notified every time I come up and I tell you my two IQs that I have been rubbing during the trial proceedings. If you want to hear about them, subscribe. Until then, 
ขึ้นไป